over to you, Krista. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Okay, so uh, Lynette gave you a little bit of a background, but um, I'm just gonna give you some basic sort of uh, life history traits and habitat of the rock jumper just to kind of get us into the same area. Um, so no South African would ever need to be asked the question, why would you study the Cape rock jumper or the rock jumper in general? Um, rock jumpers are a prime target for ecotourism, both locally and internationally. Uh, and actually last year was the year of the Cape rock jumper, which was extremely excited, exciting. And I was really glad to be able to be part of getting the promotional materials together for BirdLife South Africa. Um, yeah, because the Cape rock jumper was the 2021 bird of the year. But um, you also might recognize its sister species, the Drakensberg rock jumper, for um, being the logo of a rather, um, well, world-renowned bird tour operator. Um, scientifically, the rock jumper actually has been having declining populations as well as declining habitat in areas are, that are getting warmer. So in 2017, the IUCN did put it on their red list of endangered species as near threatened, which is one of the reasons that I was brought in to look at them. Uh, as Lynette said, they are endemic to South Africa, but even more than that, they're actually endemic just to the southwest corner of South Africa and only on the sky islands in the Cape Fold Mountains, which I've sort of put a few circles in here just to show you that um, some of these are actually quite far apart. And the rock jumpers don't really fly in a way that we would normally think of a passerine flying. Um, it's more like a controlled glide with a little bit of flapping to sort of keep them one or two meters above the ground. So they do do quite well getting from one slope to another, but the fact that they make it from one sky island to another when there could be as much as 30 kilometers of hot, dry, low Karoo between the populations is still somewhat of a mystery. And uh, I'm still waiting for that first person in the Karoo to log um, to Atlas a, a rock jumper not on a mountain because we honestly have no idea what their movements are like from between the mountains or even if they do manage to move between the mountains. Um, they have fairly large territories. A group will have up to 20 hectares and they're never layered, which I found quite interesting. They really like to be on top. So you'll never find a group of rock jumpers below another group of, group of rock jumpers, even if the habitat seems like it would be um, good for them. Oh, sorry. And the last thing I was going to say is we also don't know why there aren't any um, around Cape Town in the Cape Fold Mountains. Theoretically, this habitat is perfect for them. So I have a few sort of theories that I've never managed to look into as far as human population, cats, rats, things like that, just general traffic. But um, they do go as far down as Roy Ells and uh, Betty's Bay, the communities, um, just a little bit further along the coast. So realistically, there's no reason they shouldn't be around Cape Town. They're just not as far as we know. Uh, a bit of their group. Um, dynamics. So they are facultative breeders, which basically means they breed uh, whenever they feel like it. They can start as early as July and have nests into January. It depends mostly, I think, on temperature and precipitation and just insect availability, which is the highest in October where they live. So in general, they will all have a nest in October, but some will start quite early and some will go quite late. Um, until 2017, we thought they only had two egg nests. That's all that had ever been found before, um, but that may not be the case, spoilers ahead. Uh, and both sexes share in all of the parental activities besides the actual laying of the egg itself. And in my particular study, we didn't have very many groups of more than two, but whenever we did have a third individual, the helper was always a male. So one of the things that I really like to do is look at reproduction and nest success in birds. Um, I like to think of it as a game of hide and go seek, except they don't really know that they're playing the game. Although you could probably also argue that that is the game that they have spent their entire lives in evolutionary history learning how to play. But I really liked being able to just 
sit there and analyze their behavior and see whether or not they did their special call that told me there was a nest nearby and uh, just kind of, you know, showed that little bit more excitement that made me think maybe they have a nest and they're going to show me where it is. Um, but in 2017, we found 20 nests. And then in 2018, we actually found 45 nests, which is a huge difference considering it was the same amount of territories. Um, so we sort of started to wonder why there was a difference. And I do think we started a bit too late in our nest searching in 2017. We started in September. And like I said, I mean, some of them already had nestlings in August in 2018. Um, but also part of it was just wrong life history assumptions. Um, the only previous study on them said that they only have one nest a season. So when a bird, when a territory had had a nest and it failed, we never tried to look for another nest that year because that's what the literature had told us. But we sort of, um, I want to say accidentally found out that wasn't true when we were going to a different territory and walked through one and found they had a second nest. So in 2018, we started looking for nests all the time in every territory and we actually had one group that had five nests repeatedly throughout the year so one nest a year was definitely not the case at our site um we also just got better at looking for them and learned a bit more about their their sneaky ways and just how they change their behavior when they have a nest I found my first nest actually just by chance in 2015 when I brought a friend out to uh, Blue Hill Nature Reserve, which is where most of my research took place, uh, to show her a rock jumper. She was a keen birder and had never seen one. So I went to what I thought at the time as my most reliable pair to see, and the male was acting extremely funny. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it, but he was walking around carrying this, what look, I thought was food, but I, I think it might actually just be protea seeds in his mouth. And he just kept hopping around on this one rock, fanning his tail, um, which was obviously great. And she loved this as her first sighting. But um, yeah, it turns out that they were actually building a nest under that rock. And uh, we definitely found that the males are the easiest ones to, to use to find the nest. Uh, they do tend to get really excited and they also don't help that much with building the nest. They mostly help by just standing above it, holding nesting material and doing a lot of calling and looking around and maybe making sure there's no predators in the area. But um, he basically stood on top of this rock doing this and calling for about a half hour while we watched the female fly back and forth um, to under the nest and built the nest, um, which was really cute to watch. Their nests come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. They, some of them are really neat and put together and some of them are a bit more haphazard and a bit messy. Uh, they like to line them with um, fur from the red rock rabbit, I think is their, seems like their favorite. It would probably be my favorite too, but um, when they can't get that, they use the, the fluffy burned seeds of the the proteas, um, but some of them I found just like this this nest on the on the right. I just it looked like it had been designed by some sort of architect. Just how they'd placed it inside of a rock. Um, they do nest on the ground, which can be a little bit dangerous. But there aren't very many options to not nest on the ground in the famous. So they make do with what they can and build them usually on the downward side of a rock overhang to protect it from the elements, either rain or sun. Um, but also you'll see I put a little arrow because that nest has three eggs. And uh, we started finding three egg nests a lot in 2018, which had had a decent amount of rain. And we think that might've made the difference. Um, we actually had one pair have all five of their nests were three eggs, which was quite astounding. And we had another five territories that also laid three egg nests. Um, and of course, once you start looking for nests, your brain doesn't necessarily distinguish between species. So I sort of just became really good at looking for nests, which is helping me now because I am looking for Arabian babbler nests. And it's a, it's a pretty similar process. You just start kind of seeing that birds get a little bit excited when they're nest building and they might be in the middle of foraging and suddenly their head will pop up and they'll give a call and they'll shoot across the way. And if you follow them, they just decided randomly that they needed to go check on wherever they were making a nest. So these are all found also at Blue Hill Nature Reserve while I was looking for Cape Rock Jumper nests. 
Um, some of these were a little bit uh, strange to find, like the black-headed canary, which isn't often in the Fambos, but was because of all the fires that had gone through the Karoo. Um, Cape rock thrushes are pretty regular there. Orange-breasted sunbird is a lot another endemic to the Fambos. Uh, Long-billed crombecks are everywhere. <laughs> um, Cape clapper lark is not an endemic to the Fambos, but it is fairly limited to the region and uh, sort of same with Cape Canary, I suppose. Um, so one of the things I looked at for my PhD was how their nesting behavior would change with uh, climate change, basically. So looking at things like their provisioning rate, mainly across temperature. So I actually filmed nests uh, over two breeding seasons. Um, and we weighed the nestlings in the morning and evening at three different age ages to see sort of how their daily mass gain would change with temperature. So we weighed them at four to seven days old, eight to 12 days old, and then 13 to 16 days old. And I would set up a camera starting at about 9 a.m. and taking it away at 5 p.m. And then we'd average how many visits their, the, the parents had and their behavior just at the nest in general. So it was about 240 hours of nest behavior. Um, but it's really not that hard to watch when the birds are so stunning and charismatic. Um, just to give you an example, here's just a little bit of, of footage. Um, so this is the male coming in to feed and then they're pretty young. So he does stay and give a, a little bit of a, a brooding just to keep them warm in the morning. So um, I've edited this so uh, you don't have to watch him just sit there for I think it was probably 25 or 30 minutes, but um, they, they visit fairly regularly throughout the day. They switch on and off. They both do maintenance around the nest, cleaning it, providing food, getting rid of the, the poop sacks. Like most passerines, uh, rock jumper babies produce like a little solid white poop that can be easily cleaned from the nest and make sure it stays clean and uh, limits smell. Uh, we do ring our birds, or we tried to anyway, to be able to tell them apart so that we could tell in the groups of three which male was doing most of the of the visits. Um, yeah, <laughs> I could watch this forever, but I'll, I'll move along. Um, so I did make a bunch of different videos of the different age ranges to uh, put up on YouTube in, in, initially, but then I also put them up on eBird. And I updated the Cape Rock Jumper page for the birds of the world, and they're up there as well if you want to see them. Um, and our overall findings were that uh, as it got hotter, the parents did actually provision less, which meant that the nestlings gained less mass on days that were hotter. Uh, this had obvious implications for climate change and may have been one of the reasons that their populations are declining in areas that are warmer. But sometimes, as I like to say, the stars align, and despite everything, they do manage to fledge successfully. Uh, this is footage from one of our pred predator cameras. I had a couple infrared ones that I put out. This one um, managed to catch the most incredible little fledging video. Uh, so this is a, a very fresh fledgling. It has just left the nest, and it is very wobbly and very cute. Um, we didn't often get footage like this, and usually we had to figure out if they'd fledged by going into the territory and looking for the babies, basically. So another one of our things that we thought might be affecting their provisioning rate is that they might be decreasing provisioning at higher temperatures to reduce predation. Um, so this is a, this is a bird we affectionately called giggles because, uh, her rings were green, yellow, green, which was gig and then giggles. It made sense at the time, but uh, we actually managed to find her nests in 2016, 17 and 18 for a predation study. And she was actually the female that was with that male I showed earlier for the first nest that I found in 2015. Um, at the moment, we don't actually know how long rock jumpers live, but we do know they live at least eight years because that is the oldest rock jumper we have from ones that were caught back in 2013. So my initial theory was that the main predator of rock jumpers was gonna be the Cape Gray mongoose because it just seemed like that would make sense. They're very, very common around Blue Hill and they are definitely an avian predator. Um, but you'll see from this that actually the boomslung was the uh, most common predator of our nests. And I think this surprised everybody. Um, 
most especially my herpetologist friends who really didn't think the boomslang would even be in the Fambos. Uh, and I had to tell them not only are they there, they are doing quite well <laughs> from what we can tell. Um, so I put out, like I said, trail cameras at every nest that I found. And uh, I have to say the rock jumpers are so incredibly brave. I can't imagine being a tiny little 50 gram, gram bird and trying to do my best to attack and scare away a two meter long venomous snake. Um, I just, I, it's, it's incredible to me. I watched it happen only once in person, but we had this happen on so many different cameras. Um, and you can see here, I've, I've circled the snake and it's having a real standoff with this male. And uh, actually it wasn't until making this presentation that I saw this female was coming to help as well. Um, I'd never noticed that before, even though I've looked at this photo a million times at this point. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I do have to say, I never once saw it work with a boomslang. Um, I mean, the boomslang did not seem to really care that the adults were harassing it. Um, and, and they definitely did do a pretty decent job of uh, hurting our nests. We had a lot of predation from them. So it was a little bit sad to see. And as a scientist, it's one of the things you have to just kind of be okay with nature being nature, but it is always hard to watch. So this could be another reason that their populations are declining. Um, it's at least fairly indicative in some ways in that at higher temperatures, we had higher rates of predation from the boom slung, which could also be leading to uh, lower populations. But one of the other things I did, and this was for two full summers um, before doing the other um, studies, which probably helped me in my nest finding was that I had spent two full summers just watching rock jumpers. Uh, we did a full behavior study where we went out from dawn until dusk and we did um, point count, not point counts, uh, scan samples every five minutes recording where the rock jumper was, what they were doing, and whether or not, most importantly, they were in the sun or the shade. So finding a rock jumper, I'm sure anybody who's tried to see them can tell you is extremely difficult. Even if you know they're there and you're in a territory that you know has five birds, you may not see or hear them for the entire day. Uh, the easiest way is if they call, but they will go entire days without giving any sort of very audible call. They might be giving small little contact calls to each other, but those can't always be heard from a distance. So the easiest way to spot one is definitely catching it mid glide when they're going from one slope to another. Uh, they have a very distinctive wing and tail pattern that's pretty much unmistakable in the Fambos. Um, and you'll just see this flash of black and white glide down the hill and that's, that's your bird. Uh, Lynette sort of mentioned earlier, but the Fambos is not just known for its incredibly uh, specialized birds, but frankly, the main thing it's known for is its plants. It is the kingdom of fine bushes. It is a one of the world's six floral kingdoms, and although it's only in this small stretch in South Africa, um, it has an incredible amount of plant diversity. There's over 30,000 species of plant, more being named and discovered all the time. Um, everything from huge king proteas to different succulents, ericas, lupidendrons, all kinds of things. Um, so these are the types of things that I saw while just spending time looking for rock jumpers. Um, not just plants, there's also another, the, just small things in general. So fine bushes, but also fine animals. Um, agamas, armored crickets, a tiny little tortoise, a, each mountain in the famous pretty much has its own species of dwarf chameleon, Kreisbach and Klipspringer. Everything's miniature in the Fambos. And of course, the endemic birds of the Fambos. I don't have a photo of the Agullus lark, formerly Agullus long-billed lark, which has, I think, recently been considered an endemic of the Fambos, um, but not mountain Fambos, so I never saw it when I was there. But over five years, you do manage to get uh, I found at least one good photo of each of the endemics, uh, except the hot and top or famous button quail. Sorry, that was renamed as well. Um, that one I still and will never have a good photo of, but I have, you can see the arrow pointing to one. So I did manage to see one, but it definitely evaded my camera. 
Um, but I was lucky enough to get good shots of Victorin's Warbler there on the top left. And then we have the um, Cape Siskin, orange-breasted sunbird, just probably one of the most beautiful birds on the planet, uh, the Cape Sugarbird and the Protea canary. And as Lynette mentioned as well, there's a lot of other really neat birds that you can see in the Fambos. Uh, Gray-winged Franklin, rock thrushes, ground woodpeckers, Burroughs eagle, malachite sunbird, crew perineas are the call that you will hear pretty much consistently throughout the entire area, Bokmakiri as well. But uh, what did I find from behavior? Uh, basically that rock jumpers uh, do not really like to be out in the sun when it's hot. Like many birds, they seek shade when it gets hotter, but they do forage less when they're there. So again, this kind of brings us back to the, the nestlings and their reproductive success, seeming like maybe it's the area where they're really struggling is just to actually produce young in a given year. If the nestlings aren't gaining enough weight, the predation is getting greater when there's more, when it's hotter temperatures and the parents aren't able to maybe forage as well, or maybe not bring as decent size of prey when it's hotter. These could all be reasons that they're not doing as well at high temperatures. Um, they're not the only ones that enjoy resting in the heat of the day though. I also tended to take a nap in the middle of the day, which is why I like to have research assistants with me so that when you're out there for 15 hours watching a bird, you can each sort of take a break in the afternoon when it gets really hot. But it's basically all came down to this sort of whole picture where this is everything I looked at in my master's and my PhD boiled down to one extremely simple little diagram. Uh, physiology I did for my master's, but for my PhD, I looked at reproduction and behavior. And I did also do a brief genetic look to see if I could figure out if they were moving between the mountains, but that's still inconclusive and we're doing further analysis to see if we can really get at that question, but pretty much they're sensitive in everything when it comes to temperature. The Fambos historically has been an extremely stable climate with very few fluctuations, either cold or hot. Um, it's what makes it such a lovely place to live. And so for them, any change in temperature and any increase could actually have just a really, really large effect on them. Um, but I do like to say that the real PhD was the friends that I made along the way. And uh, it's just really was one of the most incredible experiences. These birds are so charismatic and they're so much fun and just watching them have their little interactions. I remember one time I, I watched uh, a female lay an egg, but in a way that can only be described as a bit of a, a melodramatic soap opera where the male was very excited and suddenly started calling and flew to the rock that I knew was above their nest and stood there and called repeatedly until she flew in, went down and stayed in the nest for quite some time. And he kept popping in and then popping back up and calling some more and pop, popping in and popping back up. And she eventually flew away after about 20 minutes and he followed. And when I went that she'd laid an egg and he'd just been there the whole time calling and just keeping an eye out to make sure that everything was safe while it was going on. And I just, you know, it was, it was just magical. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I could in a way, you know, talk about rock jumpers probably forever, but um, I'd like to maybe do it more from a, a standpoint of if anybody has any questions about it, uh, so I just wanted to give some thanks first to everybody that helped me with everything. This is not the kind of work that you can do by yourself. It definitely takes a team and um, a fairly large team at some times. Um, yeah, and uh, I'd also be willing to talk about what I'm doing now, which is working on the Arabian babblers, if anybody has any questions. Um, doing something sort of similar, looking at how the ones in the villages here versus the ones out of the villages, if there's differences in their reproductive success, uh, taking into account that the ones in the villages have more predation risk, but also more resource availability compared to the ones outside of the villages um, and that sort of thing. But uh, I've only been doing it for about six weeks. I actually have some active nests right now. And right before this presentation, I was doing the end of day um, mass measurements on four little cute babbler nestlings at a nest. 
So that was uh, that was pretty exciting. But yeah, uh, I will take any questions. And I'm also going to show you just a quick video I took of what is known as the Arabian babbler dance uh, that they do every morning um, to reinforce their social bonds. They gather and preen and hop all over each other as a group just to really just cement those social cohesion and everybody wants to be in the middle, which I always found really, really cute. Um, thank you. Oh, that's really very cute. Thanks so much, <laughs> Christo. Um, are there any questions? I see we don't have a Q&A um, section um, here tonight. So just can you post your questions in the chat section? Um, Krista, the one question was, do you find them in the Eastern Cape, these Cape Rock jumpers? Yes, but not very, not very far into the Eastern Cape. I think um, you can find them at um, Clay Revere, um, which is a, a private nature reserve, but they're in those Hook Mountains, um, but not from Krundel. I think you'd have to hike pretty far off the trail to get to them. You could see them in the Bavion's Cliff if you go high enough. And uh, there is that one spot up the Cape Forestry Road by Corredo where you can see them. Um, I didn't when I went there, but it was extremely windy. And uh, yeah, so I didn't manage to get them. Yes, I've seen them in the Corredo Berg, um, just north of Humansdorp. And apparently they're also at Coxcomb as well, um, in the Coxcomb Mount. Okay, yeah, that would make sense. They, yeah. I'm sure they should be. Yeah. And I think historically they used to be at Lady Slipper, but um, they are no longer there. I no, they really they haven't been since the fire. And I know I went there to look for them and the vegetation is not coming back natural. It's, it's coming back very invasive species from what I could tell. Yeah. I think what's happened is since the those huge fires, um, they've had drought for like seven mm -hmm. years, you know, since the fires. So it hasn't helped anything to grow back. So let's hope one day they do go back to Lady's Slipper. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions? Can you post them in the chat section? I should say I didn't um, speak about it, but the rock jumpers actually do better post fire as far as reproductive success. They're one of the few birds from what I could tell when I was writing up that manuscript that do most birds do better when there's a lot of concealment around the nest. Um, yes. But in general, that's thought to be because that's really good for mammal predation, which is site based. But when their main predator is the boomslung, which is olfactory, we think um, it might not make a difference. And so they actually had quite higher nest success in the burned areas. And I think boomslungs rely heavily on vegetation, you know, for um hiding in and if it's yeah. burnt, then it'll be ready for any predator like um yeah. an eagle to grab so exactly yeah. and maybe if the birds can see them from far enough off maybe then they can drive them away if they can start yes. when they're not at the nest already i think once they're at the nest there's not really anything they can yeah. do um i do see some questions uh, what is the gestation period Someone else um, oh, it is unfortunately long. They spend so much time on the ground. It is, it's an average of about 20 days as an egg and then another 20 days before they fledge. Um, so there's an entire 40 days that they have to make it just being exposed on the ground to be able to fledge successfully, which is a very, very long time for a, um, a bird <laughs> really. And I'm, I'm sure that doesn't help their situation. Yes. I see Paul was asking how many eggs do they usually lay? I think you did cover right. that. It too. Yeah. So, so we thought it was two, but now after 2018, we have to say it's two unless the conditions are better and then it's easily three. Um, that was actually something when I looked at the literature, it was supposedly one of the differences between the Cape and the Drakensberg is that Cape lay two and Drakensberg lay three, but that seems to be only in sort of poor years. Cause as soon as we had a, a decent amount of rain, there were, there were three egg nests everywhere. That's like it really amazing. was, it was about half of them. 
yeah. yeah. And I see Derek has asked, are there any behavioral differences between Cape and Drakensberg rock jumpers? That one's harder for me to answer. I didn't spend that much time with the Drakensberg. I can say they are much easier to catch. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was trying to catch some Drakensberg to be the, the comparison group for the genetic study, um, it, it was just, I don't know if it's because they're so much more used to human activity. They are slightly more habituated. Uh, I definitely went to some mountains, like I went to Kamanasi, which isn't open to people. And so those rock jumpers, maybe they'd seen a ranger drive by at some point, but other than that, they've never seen a human. Whereas the Drakensberg ones, they see people. So they're not as yeah. skittish. Um, they have larger group sizes. We know that. Um, but honestly, we think they have better reproductive success because you won't get things like a boom slung up in the Drakensberg. It's too cold yes. out there. Um, I think that there are puff adders, but the boom slung won't have never been found in the Drakensberg. So yeah. Um, that's interesting. Yes. And mm -hmm. Elizabeth's asking how many birds are estimated to exist mm -hmm. now? Uh, that was part of the reassessment. It, it isn't a small number. Like when people think IUCN endangered list, they think tiny numbers. And it isn't that tiny. It's about 30,000, I think, is the estimate. Um, it, it's, but they are like the, they're, they're barely on the list. Like near threatened is the least um, endangered that you can be and still be considered endangered. And it is like based mostly on the future and the fact that the population is decreasing um and so right now there might be around 30,000 but they did manage to put them on the list with the thought that it's it is going to go down but um yeah. how much and how quickly i don't i don't think we know that yet yeah, with climate changes and then um jean was asking do they eat both seeds and insects and does it differ depending on the season um they they never eat seeds from what i could tell um, it isn't just insects. It is uh, pretty much any, <laughs> I don't know what the term would be for it, any non-seed or fruit, really. Um, chameleons, lizards, crickets, they love orthopterans as far as like, um, frankly, the grasshoppers, I think were one of their favorites. Um, oh, that is an insect, but like spiders, anything like that. Like they will, they'll feed them any sort of protein Based, echoes, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Mary asked, are they not predated by raptors? Not very much at all. They are very, very keen observers of the sky. They definitely, I think, look mostly to the sky when they're nervous about things. I saw evidence once of a, a rock jumper being taken by a rufous breasted sparrowhawk. I didn't see it happen, but there was a rufous breasted sparrowhawk. Then suddenly there wasn't a rock jumper. And then I went there and there was feathers. So it, it's probably what happened. But um, no, I, I actually was really surprised as well. We thought we'd see some sort of corvid predation on the nests. Um, there are, you know, white neck ravens and Cape crows around. So the fact that we didn't have any corvid or, or baboons, we didn't have a single baboon predation event, which was also very interesting because they're they're everywhere there so i think they just never found the nests but i'm sure if they had of they would have eaten the eggs for sure hard crows maybe the altitude's too high for them because then yeah 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 i only ever saw white neck ravens or maybe it was pied crows i don't remember it's been too long now <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and Derek's asking genetic studies. Yay. <laughs> How long ago did they share a common ancestor, the Drakensberg? Uh, the Cape and the Drakensberg. That is still up for debate. And that was one of the things that the genes I looked at, on, I don't know. It was very interesting as far as the, the, the Cape and Drakensberg rock, rock jumper, their nearest relation is very, very far back. Um, they're the only species in their genus, in their family, and they share a, a, a suborder or like a, a supra family with the Picothartes in Western Africa. But other than that, they 
it, it, they've, they haven't had any relatives for about 20 million years as a pair of species. Um, there is some argument of whether or not they actually are different species still. I didn't find genetic answers for that one way or the other, um, but it looks like if they did split, it's pretty recent. It's probably the last major ice age, 12, 15,000 years ago, something like that. Like it's, it's, I would say more they are in the process of splitting than they are fully split if I would like, but yeah, yeah. we like to put things in boxes, but I don't think they're <laughs> quite in those boxes yet. I think they're on their way to the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> and another question, what is the nearest, um, like place where they occur? Um, I know they don't overlap at all, but. Um, ah, um, probably Mountain Zebra National Park. Uh, you can't see them there anymore because they don't do the overnight yeah. hike they used to do to where they are because they're only in those very, very high mountains, yeah. I think, at the... Yes, at the back of the park. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't think that's really accessible anymore, but that is about 150 kilometers from the nearest Cape Rock Jumper populations. That's fascinating. That's very mm. interesting. Yeah, it's it's not considering there's some Cape Mountains that are 50 kilometers apart, 150, it's it, you know, it's on the same scale. Yes. So it is pretty if they can get from one to the other, you it does make you wonder if they can get from yeah. two. Yeah. But we don't have any evidence of that either at this point. No, so. no, it's probably too far. Probably. Okay. Yeah, like a, a semi-modified allopatric, like not quite overlapping habitat, but <laughs> close to overlapping habitat. Um, I really wanted to look at the reason for their coloration. I wanted to look at diet and see if they might actually just have different coloration because of um, different diets, because the famous is really high in tannins, which produces red. Um, but also, I don't know if you've spent a lot of time in the mountains, but the Cape Mountains, the lichen on the rocks is pretty much the exact color of the Cape Rock Jumper breast. And same in the Drakensberg Mountains, the lichen there is pretty much the same orange color as the Drakensberg. So there is some pretty perfect um, yeah. yeah, like like reasoning for, for the breast yeah. color as well. That's very interesting. Um, are there any more questions before we wrap up? Looks like everybody's <laughs> happy with what they've heard. Okay, thanks so much, um, Krista. We really have learned so much from you, and I really was so envious of you spending so much time with these very special birds up in the mountains in the most beautiful part, probably of S South Africa, very scenic, mm -hmm. mountainous, and with all the fain boss. Um, th thanks so much for. Um, talking to us tonight. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Krista. And uh, for the people that are still here, hopefully you will tune in to learn the birds again. And uh, I hope that by tomorrow I will have the email sending fixed so that you can register for next for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.